So uh, I wanted to talk today. Um, uh, Buddhism uh, leads uh, kind of with the teaching of impermanence, that nothing is fixed and everything's always changing. And we usually focus on, and even the Buddha, uh, focuses on the fact that we can't keep our youth, uh, we can't keep our good looks, uh, we can't keep our health. Uh, I have one eye now that's acting a little funny. As soon as I hit 59, it just went. <laughs> but the other eye is working great. Um, and then you can tell I've, I've lost my hair. Uh, when I was young, my dad had really nice hair, and so I thought I had it made. But I should have looked at my mom's father, right? So I honestly thought that in high school and college, I was like a 7 out of 10. I mean, I was okay, but I wasn't gorgeous. But I thought, like, as I got older and older and everybody lost their hair, I'd move up to, like, an 8 or a 9. <laughs> and then, like, when I hit 60, I'd be, like, a, a hard 10 because I'd have this gorgeous hair. Uh, and when I was in England, uh, I went to get my hair cut, and the lady rolled me around in the chair. And, and I noticed there was, like, I kind of see my, <laughs> my head. And I thought maybe it was just the light. But I started to lose my hair in my early 30s. So uh, Buddhism tends to focus on those things because when we're young, that's what we hang on to the most. And you're inevitably, they're going to leave you. And for a lot of people, that causes a lot of pain and suffering. So the Buddha leads with, you know, you're not going to hang on to your youth. Uh, if you're, if you're, like, definition of a man is that you can bench press 300 pounds, uh, you're going to end up lost one day because you, you just won't be able to do it anymore, and then what do you do? Or if you're a woman and your, your looks are based on a certain characteristic that you ha have, uh, it's not going to be that way forever. So, uh, but what I wanted to talk about today is kind of the positive flip side of impermanence. Um, the reason why we practice and the reason why personal growth and change is possible is because things are impermanent. Uh, our personalities, our thoughts, our ideas, our feelings, uh, our behaviors, uh, our viewpoints are always in flux. And there's something that is very changeable through practice. But we tend to think of the world as fixed. So like a lot of people, when they do meditation service or yoga, um, I, I don't think they really think it's going to work because I think in the back of our minds, we kind of think that our, we have these characteristics that are fixed at birth and that cannot be changed, and it, it's who we are. It's our identity. So I'll give you one example. Uh, I'm the firstborn male in my family, so uh, they would always say that I'm the serious one, I'm the responsible one, I'm the smart one, I'm the successful one. Uh, but they've done research oh yeah and the the i don't know what the middle child is i can't remember but the the youngest child is supposed to be the one that's spoiled and just does whatever they want and they they just they're completely free so i'm kind of the stuffy tight older child and then the younger child's kind of the cool fun one and they'll refer to you that that in the family and it, it's a label and it's fixed and you kind of begin to wear it as a self-identification but they've done research and they've shown that that dynamic, that behavior dynamic of the firstborn child only happens within the family. It only happens at Christmas and Thanksgiving. It doesn't really happen at work. You aren't like that in your everyday life. It's, it's only within the dynamic of the family unit that the firstborn child acts like the firstborn child. So it's not fixed. It's not permanent. It's based on circumstance. And we're going to talk about that today. So uh, a lot of my, uh, well, not a lot. I want to take credit for some. But some of my Dharma talks, I, I call them crowdsourced. Uh, people in the Sangha send me things and uh, say this might be a good idea for a talk. Uh, he told me that there's a really good podcast on NPR called Invisibilia. And uh, he said there was a, a, one of the podcasts was called uh, the personality myth. And so uh, I've had some, we have a lot of smart people in our sangha and we have doctorates in psychology and they came up to me and mentioned that your, your, your traits, your characteristics may be fixed. 
those things may be fixed. Like for instance, I can't practice my hair to grow back. So there are some things that are fixed, but not nearly as much as we think. So I'm inherently uh, hyper and I'm kind of detail oriented. So that is fairly fixed. But my personality, how I express those traits in my everyday life, we're going to see is not fixed. And it's based on a lot of different factors. And so you are not your personality. Uh, and it's based on a lot of different things. So I wanted to share some of this with you. So this is the, uh, the uh, logo or image for that podcast, The Personality Myth. I just looked it up on my phone. Uh, you can listen to the whole thing. And I think it was done in, it was done in uh, June 24th, uh, 2016 on a Friday. So the premise, I think for most people, is our personalities are, are who we are. And I want to share you kind of a, uh, an interesting example. I don't know if you remember this, but there was the famous uh, marshmallow test. Uh, what they do is they put a marshmallow out in front of a young child. And I kind of wondered about the ethics of doing experiments on young children, but I guess it's a marshmallow test, so it's okay. But they bring in like four-year-olds and they put a marshmallow in front of them and they say, if you can wait two, three, four, five minutes and not eat the marshmallow, we'll come back and we'll give you two marshmallows. Now, I don't like marshmallows very much, so I think I would have not eaten the marshmallow. Uh, now, this test was supposed to show that personality is not fixed. Uh, this person, Walter Michel, who designed this experiment, the findings he found was that if you frame and give context to the experiment, the child's behavior will vary wildly. So if you tell the child, uh, pretend it's a, a cotton ball, they would easily not eat that marshmallow for five minutes. Or if you said, imagine that this is a picture or an image, they would easily wait five minutes. But if you told them, oh my gosh, this marshmallow is so great, I don't know if, how many we have left, you know, if you don't eat it now, you might not get another one anyway, they would immediately eat it. So the point of his research was, is that by contextualizing the marshmallow, the behavior, the personality of the child would be much different. That was the point of the experiment. But because in America, we think personality is fixed, the message, the conclusion of his research got uh, hijacked. And so when we listen to this video, I'm gonna play the video for you. Um, the way they explain the experiment is totally not the findings that Walter Michel was looking for. So what they claim is, is that if you can't wait five minutes to eat the mushroom, I'm not the mushroom, the marshmallow, it'd be easy for kids to wait five minutes for a mushroom. But if, if a, the idea was that if a child can't wait five minutes to eat the marshmallow, then that means that when they get older, they're not gonna have as good of grades because they don't have the discipline to study. They can't put off uh, gratification. They can't delay gratification. So they'll tend to have higher credit bills. They won't do as well at work. They won't plan for their retirement. These are the kids that won't do well. And that's totally the opposite of what he found in his experiment. So you'll hear a narrator, and I think you'll hear John Stossel from ABC News. So I think this might have been on 2020. So uh, keep this in mind. This really doesn't prove personality at five years old. It proves how the child is reacting to the context they were given. I left them alone in the room for 15 minutes. Take a look. The marshmallow test has been used for decades by psychologists. It's been used with children to predict later academic success, including literacy, SAT scores, and other academic outcomes. There's no definitive answers from the marshmallow test. It's not a matter of passing or failing. What we're looking for is whether children can really resist this piece of white candy sitting in front of them that's sweet, that, you know, the smell of it, the allure of the marshmallow. In Pratmesh's case, we really saw this added curiosity because he had never actually tasted a marshmallow before. All of the children managed to show some level of self-control and resist the temptation to eat the whole marshmallow. As you can see from the footage, you can catch a glimpse into children's ability to control their impulses. 
This ability, which is developed around the time of kindergarten, can be linked to other outcomes later in life. Yeah. So uh, we're going to hear from Walter Michelle, but he was uh, he was very frustrated. He claims that every time psychologists and psychiatrists and behavior scientists uh, do surveys and studies that show that personality is fluid, uh, the research is either kind of lost or devalued or it's reinterpreted completely incorrectly. So whether you, Walter Michel got very angry. He said, whether a child eats a marshmallow when they're five or not has no bearing on their SAT scores. It has no bearing on self-discipline. It has no bearing on their GPA. It's not fixed. And so um, this is an example where uh, we, we, we believe intuitively that personality is something that's fixed that we're, we're not seeing it, even when it's proven otherwise uh, in research. So uh, we kind of think of personality as permanent fixed traits or uh, characteristics. So we're going to listen to another uh, uh, professor. His name is Lee Ross. Uh, and he's going to contend that personalities are not consistent over time and that they're highly fluid uh, and very dynamic. So this is Lee Roth. He's a professor uh, at Stanford. And uh, one of the questions he always gets uh, is if personality is so fluid, uh, then why is my mom uh, always like my mom? Why does my mom always behave like my mother? And he said the reason why is you're seeing consistency, but not consistency of personality. You're seeing consistency of situation. So at Thanksgiving, your mom will act just like your mom always acts. But he's kind of implying that if you went on a, a girl's weekend with your mom to Las Vegas, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that's not my mom. I've never seen her behave this way. And that's because the situation has changed. So uh, I went to LABCC, the camp, the Buddhist camp, last week for uh, three days and two nights. And, you know, my behavior changes, right? Because I'm in a totally different circumstance. I'm out in the mountains at Big Bear. It's a totally different environment. Uh, I'm a lot calmer. Uh, I didn't have my laptop with me. And I relaxed and talked and walked. And I was a totally different person up in the mountains. So I was thinking this might be one reason why Buddhist monasticism became one of the main ways of practicing. One of the best ways of changing personality is to change circumstance, is to change your circumstances. So you could imagine uh, maybe not listening to talk radio, uh, maybe not listening to, um, well, like for instance, I quit watching um, Fox News and MSNBC and CNN because there's just too much arguing. Uh, I kind of quit watching the news because it's just too upsetting especially the local news. It's just one disaster after another. I can't even eat dinner. And there's a comedian who said that he did this. And they said, well, that's irresponsible. You have to be a uh, educated electorate. And I thought, well, that, that's a good, maybe that's a good criticism. But he said, no, watching the news is like watching WWE professional wrestling. There's no meat there. There's nothing of value. It's just people hysterically arguing with one another. There's no information. It's not educational. So I've, that's one of my coping skills of being a little bit calmer by not feeding myself that kind of input all day long, every day. So uh, we're going to listen to Lee Ross. Uh, this is a multimedia event. Uh, we're going to listen to the one uh, that starts with uh, Alex Spiegel saying, which brings us back to the question of consistency. So you can read along. Uh, we're going to listen to this little segment of the podcast. So this is Lee Ross. It brings us back to this question of consistency and why the personalities of the people around us often seem so consistent. The theory proposed by Lee Ross was that we see consistency not because of this thing inside people, their personality, but because people are usually embedded in stable situations. Because the circumstances that are influencing their behavior remain consistent. 
That is, we exist inside jobs and families that hold us in place. Sometimes the specific dynamics of those jobs and families ask us to be the same kind of person at work and at home, pastor at work, kind father at home. Sometimes the dynamics at work and home ask us to be different, gangster at work, kind father at home. The point is that ultimately it's the situation, not the person, that determines things. People are predictable, but they're predictable because we see them in situations where their behavior is constrained by that situation and by the roles they're occupying and the relationship they have with us. Huh. But even though the power of situations was big scientific news for a while, Ross says the studies never changed how people actually thought. Oh, no, certainly not. I don't think... I don't think it changed. I don't even think it changes very much for most psychologists. It's a very, very powerful bias, this tendency, at least in our culture, to keep feeling that ultimately people's behavior is a reflection of who they are. And it's no wonder, as Walter Michel told me, that we're drawn to this idea that personality is important and stable. It makes us feel better. I mean, how can you marry anybody unless you believe that they're essentially going to be like you've got them pictured now? We like to feel that we're living in a stable world. It's, I think the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn about its instability. Uh, the, the more we learn about any science, the more we learn about its endless complexity. When it comes to human beings, we really don't have tolerance for realizing that there is an enormous amount of complexity. So when they said uh, gangster at work, uh, caring father at home, I, I think that's one of the reasons why like Sopranos is kind of interesting or some of the reality TV shows are interesting because it, it's just unbelievable. Like it's weird watching uh, like a, like a uh, MMA fighter uh, at Vaughn's with his two little kids uh, shopping for dinner, right? I've noticed that on reality shows. It's, it's weird to see that contrast between the what they do at work and then when they come home, they're changing diapers. And so that, that, that context is what causes us to change our behaviors. So I wanted to show you, um, again, that situations can be consistent but maybe not our personality. So I think coming to Temple is one of those things. You're placing yourself in a very different circumstance or situation than you're normally in in your everyday life. So you come here, uh, people, I mean, this was my impression. Uh, people at church are much kinder. Uh, they tend to defer. Uh, everybody's not grabbing things. They always like say, no, you take the cookie. No, you take the cookie. And there's that rule. <laughs> You, you say no three times, and then if they insist, then you take the cookie. Uh, and you, I learned you never take the last cookie. Nobody's ever supposed to take the last cookie. But from my culture, I would rush because there's only one cookie left, and I got to get it. It was like a... And then the other thing here is that, well, you don't know this, but in the men's bathroom, they even defer. Like, no, you take the urinal. No, you take the urinal. No, you take the urinal. And at my work, I, one day in the bathroom, I thought, nobody does this at my work. At my work, we cut each other off to get the urinal. So it really is different here. It's really different here than it is at my work. Um, so uh, I think the circumstance here uh, really affects our behavior. But what do we do when we go back to work and when we go back to our families? So we're going to think about that from Walter Michel. So he kind of claims there's two ways of changing your personality. You either change your situation, and for a monastic, that's possible. And I could go to Big Bear for three days, but changing my situation is not practical. I, I have a mortgage, I've got kids, I, I really can't radically change my situation. Um, but what I can do, that Walter Michel talks about, is what you, you recontextualize your situation. You reinterpret your situation. You find new meaning in it. And in that way, you can change the way you think and act. So this is Walter Michel, uh, the famous person 
that designed the uh, marshmallow test that does not prove your grade point or what college you're going to go to at five years old because you ate a marshmallow. Uh, what he said was, again, is that by talking to the children prior to the experiment, you could radically affect the outcomes. And so what he proved was that we're very susceptible and our behavior changes radically based on circumstance. Uh, it was a proof of, of the fluidity of personality. It was not an indicator of future outcomes. So I think Walter Michel uh, died recently. Uh, I think, I didn't look it up this morning, but within the last year or two, uh, he was at Harvard and he had to teach a class on uh, behavior and personality and he started looking at the literature and he found all kinds of, of research showing that personality was fluid even though nobody was teaching that. So this is how he began to pursue this research area. So again, uh, we can change our situations, which is not always practical, or we can change our minds. We can change our minds. So we're gonna start with the second handout. This one's two-sided, and it starts with uh, maybe we're not thinking about it, uh, about who we are and what we can be. So this is a very positive message uh, from Walter Michel about life and about uh, Buddhist practice. Maybe we're not thinking right about who we are and what we can be. That's Michelle again, who told me that to truly understand how people change, you actually have to consider a third way of looking at all of this and think about the role played by the brain. The source is this thing up here that's called your mind and your brain. And stay with me here for a second because what Michelle does, I think, gives a broader view that shows how personality and situation all fit together. So to explain it to me, Michelle drew a small diagram on the blackboard behind his desk. I'm, I'm gonna go to a... Yeah, okay. Uh, can I come with you? Yeah, of course. On the board, Michelle drew three circles. The first represented personality, your traits, your temperament. Then he drew a second circle. Here are the situations, okay? But in between the two, Michelle drew a third circle. This, he said, poking the board, is your mind. That wonderful, curious thing that houses all kinds of invisible stuff. Like your expectations, your stable expectations of, about what happens if you do certain things. It has in it your way of construing or seeing or framing or depicting different situations. So when I'm in a large group, do I feel terrified or because it's a scary situation? Or when I'm in a large group, do I see it as a challenge because he has an opportunity to really reach a lot of people? All this stuff in your mind, these beliefs, assumptions, expectations that you've gotten from your friends, your family, your culture, those things, Michelle explained, are the filter through which you see the world. Your mind stands between who you are, your personality, and whatever situation you're in, and profoundly influences how your brain interprets the world around it. Those beliefs, expectations, assumptions, they direct what your mind pays attention to, quite literally, even what it physically sees in a situation, and how it feels about what it sees. And so, when the stuff inside the mind changes, people change. They begin to interpret their situations differently or themselves differently, and so situations act on them differently. People can use their wonderful brains to think differently about situations, to reframe them, to reconstruct them, to even reconstruct themselves. This is why Michelle sees people as fundamentally flexible. He tells me that is the single most important thing that he has stood for in his whole professional life. What my life has been about is in showing the potential for human beings to not be the victims of their biographies, uh, not their biological biographies, not their social biographies, uh, and to show in great detail the many ways in which people can change what they become and how they think. So 
I wanted to mention that uh, in Buddhism, uh, they use the word uh, noble a lot. And uh, I've talked to a lot of Sangha members. They don't really like the word noble because it sounds like royalty, like royal blood, or it sounds elitist. But, uh, and of course, the Buddha didn't use the word noble. It's a translation. But we often say the Four Noble Truths or the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and there's a famous um, scholar named Richard Gombrich who says uh, this is the singest, single biggest translation error in all of Buddhism. He said it's not the truths that are noble and it's not the path that's noble. It's people who live by these truths and who practice the way acquire nobility. So in Buddhism, the Buddha would say, he lived in a time of castes, he would say that your nobility is not based on birth, it's not based on your financial holdings of your family, it's not your family name, it's not that you have hair or not, it's not that you're 6'5 instead of 5'6. Uh, nobility in Buddhism is acquired through practice. These are characteristics that you begin to imbue and imbibe and uh, effortlessly come out of you uh, when you practice the teachings. And then the other thing I wanted to mention that uh, Michelle was talking about uh, was that uh, we don't realize it because it's really effortless, but we assign meaning to the events in our lives. So we, it seems like the meaning in life is uh, fixed and external, but it's very dynamic and it's very internal. So depending on how you're feeling uh, and what you believe, uh, we assign meaning, and it, it's very subtle. I, I do it all the time, you know. Thing, and, and you can uh, reconcile relationships by merely changing the way you see things. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is one of the strongest biases we have. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. I had to take a lot of logic and philosophy in school. Th there's a lot of um, uh, logic errors and biases we have. Uh, one famous one is uh, kind of attacking the speaker. Um, you know, if somebody says something you don't agree with, you say, well, um, they didn't go to college. So it's poisoning the well. Like, th th that doesn't, that you're not addressing their argument in any way. You're attacking the person because you don't really want to address the issue they've brought up. Uh, but one of the biggest ones is uh, confirmation bias. Uh, this one is supposed to be the worst. We only see things. We only notice evidence that kind of proves we're right. We only see things that kind of justify our beliefs and ideas. And so we ignore things that challenge us. And this is very dangerous. And so in Buddhism, we really try to open ourselves up to that. And one of the ones I did that's bad that I noticed uh, whenever there's a bad driver on Beach Boulevard, I get cut off. And this really happened. I'm not proud of it. I said, oh, she's a lame driver. I said, that lady's not a very good driver. And Linda said, what? <laughs> she goes, why do you assume it's a lady? And I'm like, I don't know. And it turns out it was a man. It was a man. So what I do is if a man cuts me off, I think, well, they're in a hurry, they're busy. You know, they've got somewhere to go, they're important. But if a woman cuts me off, they're ditzy or they're not paying attention or they're on their iPhone. And, and if there's a really good driver that's a woman, I, I don't notice her. And if there's a really bad driver that's a man, I, I kind of think it's a one-off. It's some rare outlier. And so we do this a lot. And we do this with ethnic groups, with racial differences. Whatever you think about an ethnic group, you always look for proof that your bias is correct. And every time you're, it's challenged, uh, you ignore that. And so um, these are things we really try to work on in Buddhism, to try to see things clearly and not only from our perspective. And I think, uh, you know, we, we change our environment from coming to service, but then what we really try to do is go out into the world at, with awareness and really keep track of what we're feeling and why we feel it and what the triggers are. And, and kind of not be blissfully ignorant or blissfully arrogant uh, in our beliefs and our thoughts and, and try to uh, maybe challenge uh, what we think and believe. So um, anyway, I, 
I don't really use science to justify Buddhism. I think my attitude is that, uh, I think my attitude is, is that science is discovering the same things that the Buddha realized. But in our culture, we tend to rely on science as the ultimate, uh, the ultimate source of truth in our culture. So I sometimes feel like if the Buddha said it, well, you know, he's a religious guy. But if Walter Michel says it, you're like, wow, that guy's from Harvard. <laughs> so I like to bring in uh, these types of, of uh, real world examples. It also shows that Buddhism's not uh, mystical. It's not uh, different. It's, it's just part of everyday life. It, it's very common, very practical. Um, you can find it anywhere. So uh, I talked for almost 45 minutes. Uh, so usually what we do now is, does anybody have any comments or questions? Your talk this morning um, dovetails neatly with the practices of mindfulness and meditation. It's that pause that you suddenly start to learn how to take before you react. That's the way I've used meditation and mindfulness to catch myself reacting to certain situations and knowing that that may not be the best reaction that I could have. And I try and take what I'm learning here out into the world with me. And part of it is just that pause, that awareness that I bring now to my life that I didn't necessarily practice successfully before. Yeah, that's excellent. So they, they sometimes use the term uh, gap. There's a, a, there's, if you can have just a small gap, then you respond rather than react. So yeah, that, that's very important. That's very helpful. Any comments about the lecture or does anybody want a marshmallow or? <laughs> I had a question. Um, the gangster goes off to work and he comes home. Well, some of the gangsters are gangsters at home too. The situation doesn't uh, modify their behavior. In fact, we have People go off and are kind at work and come home. They're mean to the wife and to the child. So, so uh, how do we explain that? Uh, well, uh, it may be that the the habitual behavior they have is really deep, and they maybe they need a radical change of situation. Maybe going from work to home, the contrast isn't great enough for them to have an impact. So, uh, like for me. I didn't change at all until I started practicing Buddhism. So I was the same at work as I was at home. I was impatient, I was angry, and I was miserable. And then when I began to listen to the teachings and I heard a different way of seeing and I began to practice Buddhism, th that's when I finally began to change. So I do agree with you. I have a follow-up on that. Um, could we say that the, we got the gangster who's kind at home and the one that isn't? Is there something inherent in their, in their, the context of their lives, their background? The, my father was mean to me, so I'm going to be mean to my children. That's, that's how we learned. Or is there something inherent in the personality? Well, I think th this is where this thing about characteristics and traits and personality begin to blur. Um, I do think that these two scholars would say that there are some inherent tendencies or characteristics that we have. But I think they're saying that it's much less, th that is less of a determinant of your behavior than we think it is. So I think they're saying you don't have to be the victim of an abusive father. Most people are, and you're right, that pattern of behavior continues, but it, it's not a fait accompli. It's not it's not like it's not like the die has been cast and there's nothing that can be done. So, so our personalities are plastic, would you say? Uh, I think they're more fluid. What they're saying is they're much more fluid than we think. So I don't think they're saying that you know your experience in life or uh, tendencies that you were born with 
aren't major players, but much less than we think. So I think what they're trying to do is kind of balance the extreme view. So for instance, I, you have to listen to the whole podcast, but there's an idea that successful people are fundamentally different than unsuccessful people. That successful people are disciplined, they have these traits they were born with. And they would argue that, uh, well, one thing we tend to do is we t kind of tend to focus on the people that are successful. There are many people who work really, really hard in an industry, and because of timing or cash flow or circumstance, they don't make it big. So um, Steve Jobs and um, Bill Gates are, you know, amazing entrepreneurs in computer science, but an argument I've heard that if, they, if it hadn't had been for them, somebody else would have broke as well and made it. So, you know, the industry was moving toward mini miniaturization. The industry was moving toward smaller and smaller computers. Those two were the two that hit it big. But there was a lot in the game due to timing and circumstances that didn't make it. And it's not an inherent, they, they weren't inherently inferior. So th it's just a different way of looking at things. I do think, though, in behavioral sciences and psychology, there is a lot of gray. And I honestly don't know where personality starts and traits and characteristics end. So that would be interesting. Like, I, I do have certain traits, but the way they express themselves, I think of as personality. So that's kind of how I make the distinction.